William Shakespeare. Screw the state standards. I cannot in good conscience let you graduate and not know who this guy is. If that's not a good enough reason, tough. What do you see when you think of William Shakespeare? Do you see some stuffy old bald guy from a textbook? Or do you see someone young and hip and exciting? People hear the name Shakespeare and shut down. You study Shakespeare all through high school and college, and most of you will finish your education without really understanding why we make you study him. I'll get to that, I promise. But I think the first hurdle is finding a way to relate to the man himself. In his day, William Shakespeare was a lot more like the young actor who plays him in this TV show than the old wood-carving photograph that you often see in your textbooks. William Shakespeare was born in the year 1564 in a town called Stratford-upon-Avon. Stratford was a small country town. It still is, as a matter of fact. They get a lot of tourism because of Shakespeare, but outside of that, there's not much of a town there. It's a small community with a lot of farm work going on right next to a pretty big river. Does that sound like anywhere you know? Because to me, it reminds me a lot of Ashland City. Shakespeare grew up in a place just like I grew up and just like a lot of you grew up. He wasn't rich. He wasn't important. It's not like his family was a big deal. His father made gloves for a living. They weren't poor, but they weren't wealthy either. Just like most of us, Shakespeare grew up in the lower middle class. His family was Catholic. They were religious in the normal amount. They weren't fanatics about it, but they also weren't secretly practicing any sort of pagan religion. They were a nice, normal Catholic family. Shakespeare attended public school until the age of 14. During this time period, it was normal for a kid to start school at seven years old and leave school at 14. That is, if you were a boy child. Often families didn't bother to educate their girl children because why did a girl need to be able to read and write? She did need to be able to do a little bit of arithmetic, but she could learn that at home. Boys went to school year-round from sunrise to sunset. So even though Shakespeare only went to school for seven years, he had as much of an education as you guys get by the time you graduate from 12 years of public school today. Shakespeare didn't attend college because at the time, you really only went to college if you were going to be a priest or a lawyer. So everything he knew as he entered adulthood was the result of a public school education. When Shakespeare was 17 years old, he had sex with a woman named Anne Hathaway, who was 25 at the time. 17 was actually considered pretty young for a man to get married back then. Most men weren't really considered eligible bachelors until they had established themselves in their career field. If you got a girl pregnant, however, your only choice was to get married. They had a daughter named Susanna six months after their wedding date. They ended up having two more children together, a set of twins named Hamnet and Judith. Up to this point, Shakespeare's life story sounds really familiar. He's a guy with a high school education who knocks up a girl when he's 17 and marries her. We all know someone like that, and if you don't, go to Walmart and throw a rock and you'll probably hit one. But then something happened that changed his life and world history forever. In 1585, Shakespeare was 21, and he got a job acting in a touring company of players. After Queen Elizabeth took the throne and outlawed religious theater, she realized she could use the system that had been in place for centuries to her advantage, the system of guild-run pageant wagon plays. So she arranged for groups of actors to tour plays around England. These were plays chosen or written because they had a political message that made the queen look really good compared to her sister Mary, who came before her. It's thought that Shakespeare got involved with one of these kinds of companies because of the strong political undertones of most of his plays. Despite the fact that he was Catholic and Elizabeth was Protestant, he was working doing pro-Elizabeth propaganda plays. Propaganda is a term that means selling an idea. It's kind of like advertising. 
But where advertising wants to sell you a product, propaganda wants to sell you an idea. And these particular plays wanted to sell the idea that Elizabeth was the rightful heir to the English throne and that she was a good and just and divinely appointed leader. He had a lot of success working in these touring companies, and by 1592, he had established a solid career as a professional actor. Believe it or not, during this time period, acting was taught in schools as a way to develop rhetoric. Rhetoric is basically public speaking. So students would often practice speaking Latin and Greek by acting out ancient Greek and Roman plays. Playwriting, however, was not taught in school. So Shakespeare probably learned how to compose during the seven years he spent touring with these pro-Elizabeth propaganda plays. We're studying this man today because 400 years ago, a guy with a perfectly average life was smart enough to take advantage of his education and seize an opportunity when it presented itself. William Shakespeare's early plays were history plays and adaptations of older plays. It has always been common for young playwrights to begin with this kind of material, but it's further evidence that Shakespeare's first acting job was in a pro-Elizabeth company because the bits of history he chose to write about were the bits that supported Elizabeth's claim to the throne, either by making her ancestors look really good, like he did in the play Richard III, or reminding people that bad things happen to people who try to overthrow the government, like he illustrates in Julius Caesar. But even when his plays are not strictly historical, there's a lot of political content under the surface. Shakespeare's plays can get very preachy. All of his work carries some kind of message for the audience, though in some instances it's harder to spot than others. And some scholars say that all of his plays are allegories about events that were actually taking place in England at the time. For example, in Romeo and Juliet, the Capulets and Montagues represent the Protestants and the Catholics who were at each other's throats. They are the two households both alike in dignity. Julius Caesar reminds the audience what happens to those who incite rebellion against a ruler because there were a lot of people, if you will remember, who thought that Elizabeth was a bastard and did not have any claim to the throne and were plotting to try to assassinate or overthrow her. In The Merchant of Venice and Othello, the audience is made to confront racism against Jewish people and quote-unquote Moors, a term at the time for black people. Over the course of his career, Shakespeare wrote 37 plays and 154 sonnets, which is a huge body of work for a single person. We also estimate that he added between two and 3,000 words to the English language. He just made them up, and we're still using them today. Shakespeare wrote in a style of poetry called blank verse, which means he wrote in lines of 10 syllables that followed a set rhythm. He used this style because it was the fashionable thing to do, but where Shakespeare excels over his contemporaries is that he makes the verse work for him. Shakespeare was effective and popular because he understood his audience. Shakespeare knew the crowd that would come to see his plays. Lords and ladies might cross the river to watch a play. Nice middle-class families or the lowlifes around Southwark. He mixed beautiful poetry and important themes with dirty jokes and common prose to appeal to everyone. And it worked. Let's take a look at this excerpt from Romeo and Juliet. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it, cast it off. In this excerpt, we find the most famous romantic speech in history. What you won't learn about an English class is the dirty joke concealed within it. Romeo compares Juliet with the sun and the moon, and at first blush, it's just a really nice compliment. However, England had been a part of the Roman Empire, and anyone who had been educated 
would have learned about ancient Rome at school, including learning about Roman mythology. In Roman mythology, Diana was the goddess of the moon, but she was also the goddess of virginity. When Romeo tells Juliet to kill the moon, we can take that to mean that he's telling Juliet to get rid of her virginity. The words vestal livery are another clue. Vestal straight up means virgin, and livery is a term for clothes. When he tells her to cast off her vestal livery, Shakespeare's audience would have interpreted that as Romeo telling Juliet to get naked. Shakespeare is known for his writing, and he worked most of his career as an actor, but he made his money as a theater manager. He earned enough to ensure that his family was comfortable, and he was able to buy houses for his children in Stratford-upon-Avon. We also think he wasn't entirely faithful to his wife. Shakespeare wrote a series of sonnets or poems that have come to be known as the Dark Lady Sonnets, which are love poems to a beautiful woman with dark features. The thing about it is, his wife didn't look like the way the woman in the poems is described. We also know that Shakespeare, as a man, was a little on the cocky side. He was described thusly by the poet Robert Greene. There is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you. Basically, Greene is saying that Shakespeare thinks he's better than everyone else. Upstart indicates Green thinks Shakespeare has no right to any of his success because Shakespeare was just some nobody from the country. Tiger's heart wrapped in player's hide is sort of like calling Shakespeare a wolf in sheep's clothing. We also know that Shakespeare was brought up at least one time on charges of grievous bodily harm. That means that at least once, Shakespeare beat the crap out of somebody, likely in a bar fight. Shakespeare died on his birthday in 1616 at the age of 64. He's buried in Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon, and his grave is cursed. Inscribed on the grave marker is this quote, Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Shakespeare is considered the greatest playwright of all time. His work endures because he taps into universal human nature with themes that include love, hatred, jealousy, revenge, racism, politics, class injustice, war, poverty, the corrupting influence of power, depression, sex, religion, grief, insanity, kindness, cruelty, joy, redemption, temptation, gender roles, sibling rivalry, parent-child conflict, and the list keeps going. Which is to say, when it comes to Shakespeare, there really is something for every audience.